Welcome to Impact Farming, where we introduce you to the people and ideas that will have a massive impact on your farming operation. Brought to you by Farm Marketer. Sit down, start the engine, and let's roll with today's show. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of the Impact Farming Show. Today, we have an awesome guest with us. We have Dick Whitman returning once again. Welcome back, Dick. How are you? Just wonderful. Excellent. We had Dick on the show, I'd say a couple weeks back. I'm not even sure how many weeks back. And he was sharing more about his guidebook that he built, Building effective farm management systems. Now today, I brought Dick back on to share some best management practices when it comes to farm finances. So really quick, I want to share a little bit about our guest and I'll get him to dive in and share some of his experience as well. So Dick Whitman, he is the former manager and board chair of a 20,000 acre Idaho family farm. He is a farm management consultant and he is a trainer. And you know what? I have just summed up 40 plus years of experience really quick, right, Dick? (laughs) I just skimmed right over. So why don't you share a little bit more with your audience about who you are, what you do, and then we'll dive in to some really important practices that you're going to share. And I know you said it best earlier, Dick, a lot of the farmers are parking the combines, all the equipment, taking inventory, and as we wrap the year up, this is an important time of year where we should also be looking at the farm business. And I know he is so passionate. You are so passionate, Dick, about farm financial management. And you're going to share some areas where farmers should focus on to make sure they excel in their business. So long-winded intro. Welcome, welcome. Why don't I get you to share more about who you are and what you do? Well, just you've, you've recapped basically. I started out in my career with in ag lending, working mostly with large and complex loans and supervising banking institutions. And then I came back in 1980 to manage a diversified family business. And at the same time, I started a consulting practice working on both financial management as well as family business governance and family business issues. So for 40 years, I kind of liken it to, I go out on the road and I I preach the gospel on best practices in financial management and uh, governance. Then I have to come home and practice what I preach in our own operation. (laughs) I've always felt like that was a tremendous privilege to be able to learn daily why we implement this, how do we implement this, and continually learn how to advance towards a professionally managed business. And the the focus of today's discussion is on the financial side. Most farmers don't get into farming because they love to do financial statements or do racial analysis. They they get into farming because they want to grow things. And they look at the quality of life of living in a real community. But if you're going to excel as, as a farm business, there are some essential uh, practices that you need to get, develop the ability to understand how to do these things, the discipline to do them on a regular basis, and so that you know how your business is performing, what your trends are, how to make proper decisions on capital purchases, and so forth. Mm. So what... What we're going to do today, Tracy, is just kind of walk through about 10 areas that farmers typically uh, struggle with. And by adopting many of these practices, it elevates their ability to realize realize what they're doing on a a real life basis, not just how they're doing for tax purposes. Mm. 
Whenever you're ready, I'll just start down my list and take it away. I'm All excited. Right. Well, the first topic is understanding the difference between cash and accrual net income. And most farmers in the US and Canada are allowed to file tax returns on a cash basis for tax purposes. And basically, that has no um, relationship whatsoever to what kind of profit your business is really making. Uh, an accrual-based net income is, is looking at matching the true expenses that were incurred in a given year, whether or not you paid them or not, to the actual value of production that you created in a given year, whether or not you market it or not. So there are very specific procedures that you can go through to convert your tax data to accrual data. And farmers that can master this have a really good understanding of what their true profitability is. And those who are not making these adjustments and looking strictly at tax data, they have no idea whether they're making money or not. Okay. So I don't know if you want any specific examples, but when yeah, we get, why don't we? So for example, let's say you raised a million dollars worth of crop this year, but you deferred 300,000 of that into the coming year. Your cash sales are only $700,000 and that was, that's what would be reflected in your taxable income. Okay, gotcha. If we're ignoring the other $300,000 of inventory that we've created, uh, you can flip the other way around. If we, if we ran up $800,000 of bills this year to create this year's production, but we came into the year owing 100,000 and we ended up the year owing 200,000 of unpaid bills, we have increased our amount of unpaid expenses. So our accrual net income is gonna be lower than our tax basis because we're punting expenses into a new year in which we'll pay them. And those, those individual details are all the things that need to be captured when you're looking at accrual versus cash net income. Okay. Most farmers have had good training in some of the ag schools and in some of the workshops on how to do this. But the challenge is, do you develop a template so that you can do this every year for your farm? Are you getting your tax advisors or your accounting advisors to help you with this to make sure you're doing this consistently from year to year? Okay, let me make sure I understand because this is one that I've actually never even dove into. But I, I think I might do something naturally here. My books for Farm Marketer are very straightforward. Income in in the month, income out. There's nothing deferred. I don't prepay anything. Easy peasy, love it. Now the farm books are different because like you said, we might have 100,000 of cattle sitting in a pen, not sold, but that's income for this year. So I always get mad at our financials because to me, they're not real. Like they don't show the income and expense within the year. And to me, I flounder when I look at those, ex at those financials. So actually what I do is I take an Excel version and then I pop in the income for that year and then try and get a real picture. Is that what you're talking about? Ish? Yeah. It's very, you know, there's, there's multiple factors that go into getting to accrual. And so it isn't just the change in inventory from year to year. It's not just the change in accounts payable from year to year. It's also things like the second item on our list, which is, are you calculating both tax and book depreciation? Okay. Yeah. Farmers have been allowed in, in both U.S. and Canada to do accelerated depreciation and write-off equipment much faster than it's actually wearing out. So you get the write-off, but you have not really incurred that kind of a loss in value for your equipment. Okay. So if you're doing taxable income that uses tax basis depreciation, in order to get to accrual, you need to adjust that back to a book basis or economic life, which is a more accurate reflection of how much your equipment is going down in value annually. Okay. You've written off a quarter of a million dollars in depreciation expense this year, 
that your equipment line might have only gone down in value maybe a hundred thousand. Okay. So on a tax basis, you've overstated by one hundred and fifty thousand dollars your true expenses. Mm. If you're trying to convert to accrual, you need to use the economic or book based depreciation. That's funny. I just make up my own accounting system, I realize. <laughs> when I get, I have my financials, I'll flip over to Farm Marketer because I actually find those financials so much easier. At, at the end of the year, we don't have amortization in there, right? So mm -hmm. that's the numbers. And I go, okay, that's, that's my real financials. And then the accountant, my bookkeeper puts my amortization in. And then I actually just make up my own system and take it out <laughs> to get to what I call my true financials. But anyways, guys, listen to Dick. Don't listen to me. <laughs> well, this is, it's amazing. A lot of people actually make an attempt to do accrual net income analysis and they, they do all the adjustments except for depreciation. And the failure to use economic versus tax depreciation can, can make your true net income be off by 80%. Oh, yeah. You know, if you were riding off a big tractor or combine in one year when it's got a 10-year useful life. So having a good procedure to do cash to accrual and also making sure that it includes that tax versus economic depreciation is really critical. Okay. Sorry, I dove right in there, but I had to ask and I'll throw myself under the bus right on the show for the benefit of everybody. But that's one that I really haven't understood. So I'm glad that you touched on that. Thank you. Our next topic is addressing cost versus market value balance sheets. Um, a lot of producers really don't have a clean version of either one. They've got some assets on the balance sheet at cost, some of them on the balance sheet at current market value. And I really believe that every farm operation should have a clean set of clearly differentiated cost as well as market value uh, balance sheet values. Okay. So let's say that you've written off all of the expenses associated with creating this year's crop production so when you sell them, when you sell that crop, um, you've already written off the expenses, so they have a zero basis on your balance sheet. And so 100% of your, your sale is income. Um, let's say you're sitting at the end of the year and you're creating a balance sheet. On a cost basis, your, or tax basis, you have zero tax basis in your inventories because you've already written those off in the previous year. But on a market value basis, they have significant value. Let's take equipment. On a tax basis, because you've depreciated it out rapidly, they may have a very low net basis, cost versus market versus accumulated depreciation. But on a market value, your equipment could be worth three to four times what your tax basis is. Okay. So that difference between market value and tax basis is called deferred gain or unrealized income. So if you, if you were to sell out the business tomorrow, you would want to know what's my tax basis and my assets and what's my market value and how much gain would I be exposed to to sell. And that's just a good foundational set of knowledge for doing estate planning, tax management. If you are thinking about getting rid of an asset, knowing that basis and knowing the implications of disposition are really critical. Land is particularly an issue. If you've held land for a long time, you probably bought it at relatively low levels. So on a cost basis, your land might be worth a million dollars and on a market value basis, it might be worth $10 million. Okay. So you have 10, 10 minus one, you've got $9 million of unrealized gain or deferred income. So if you were to sell a business tomorrow and you had to trigger that gain on that $9 million, ask yourself, what kind of tax would I owe the government to be able to put that money in the bank? So I think that's the secret here is looking at all these items and saying, 
what is my net worth on a cost basis? What is my true net worth on a market value basis? And what is the difference? And the difference is what we would call unrealized gain or deferred income. Hmm. I have a client, for example, that thought they were pretty well off. They had a $20 million net worth. But when we did a cost and market value comparison, their cost basis was around $8 million and their market value was 20. So they had a $12 million deferred gain. And in their tax bracket, they were gonna give away about 50% of that in taxes. So all of a sudden they realized divided four ways, we're not as well off as we thought we were. Hmm. So we can get awfully hung up with just raw data giving us market values on the balance sheet without looking at tax consequences or difference between market and cost. Okay, can I ask you a question about Tracy's made up accounting system? Yep. <laughs> Don't let me do your books, folks. It won't end well. Well, I mean, I'm pretty happy that I have it. So we have software where our books are done and I treat that over here, but I also have a simple Excel spreadsheet, which I call my net worth. And at the top is all the assets, everything we own and what they're worth. And I do market value. If I was going to sell in a good situation, what is my land worth, cattle worth, all of this stuff, right? And then the liabilities, what do I owe on each of those items? And at the bottom is obviously the net worth, the difference. So what you're saying, and I had never thought of that, I said, oh, great, here's our net worth. This is fantastic. And I just was listening to a podcast the other week of all random things. They said exactly what you said. People's net worth is great if you have it and you should because you need it, especially for bankers. But we forget to account for the fact that tax comes into play. So are you saying I should actually have two questions? I should actually probably have a market value net worth statement and a more, uh, I guess if things had to sell quickly, I might not get premium dollars. Two situations? I think you, you have to have that. Okay. And it isn't that you plan to sell out tomorrow, but if you, if you look at your cost versus your market value and, and look at that difference of unrealized gain, every year, this is an interesting little mathematical relationship, the amount by which your unrealized gain changes from one year to the next is your net accrual adjustment, basically. Hmm. So, you know, if you're in a good production cycle and good prices and you're accumulating more and more inventory and letting your bins fill up fuller and fuller and you're prepaying more and more expenses, you might think that your, your taxable income is staying fairly level, but on an accrual basis, it's going up and up and up. Okay. But you're also building, as you're building larger and larger unrealized gain, you're also building up a larger and larger deferred tax bill. Mm. The only way you're going to beat tax is to die. Most people, their goal is to defer tax, but they're not going to eliminate tax. So knowing what your difference is between cost and market value and, and really making an attempt annually to calculate what your deferred tax would be is, is a really good practice. Okay. I have a new activity for my Christmas holidays. There you go. <laughs> Okay, excellent. Thank you for clarifying that. The next topic is one that we all know we should do, but we, we struggle with doing it well. And that's how do you get to an accurate cost of, of production for each marketable commodity that you produce? Mm -hmm. I have spent decades working in this field with the Farm Financial Standards Council, um, developing management accounting standards and, and particularly with a lot of focus on getting accurate cost of production. And that's an area that I, a lot of farmers think that they have a pretty good handle on what it costs them to grow what they grow. But I find a lot of cases they're using a lot of academically incorrect processes 
And so this is not something that we will be able to educate people on how to do in a one hour podcast, but those people who can master this, that understand what their variable and their fixed costs are and how their cost of production has varied from year to year, they now have a more solid foundation for marketing. Um, they, if what they know what that cost is and if they set a 20 or 30% margin and the market gives them an opportunity to sell at that level, then they can sell with confidence that they're putting a profit in the bank. But if you don't know your cost of production, your marketing system becomes one of hope. Hope it's high enough to cover my costs. But not knowing exactly what those costs are, we don't really know, okay, we sold, but maybe we shouldn't have, we should have waited because it's below cost of production. And there are times where we have no choice but to sell below the cost of production because that's the best market we have, but we should know how bad that is and how much our, our market price is deficient in covering our costs. Makes sense. Yeah, and you're right. We can't get into the details on the fixed and variable and all that because that would be a whole nother three episodes, right? So my next topic is a little bit of a, may sound like a Sunday sermon, but when, when people ask you how your year went, and I don't hesitate to tell people we had a good year. Mm-hmm. And then they usually come back, well, you're going to pay a lot of tax. And you know what I always say? I love to pay tax. Yeah. And they look yeah. at me like I'm crazy. But if you think about it, the only way that you can put – after-tax net worth to the bottom line that you can spend is to create a commodity value, market it, pay the expenses, pay the taxes, and now you have money to spend. Yeah. But you can't, you can't spend unsold inventories. See what I mean? So I've seen many cases where people passed up on 7 and $8 wheat or corn because they didn't want to pay the tax bill. And they would have, they could have paid a huge tax bill, but put half a million dollars of net income into their net worth after tax. You know what I mean? That is now money you can spend. You can buy tractors, you can buy land, you can take a vacation. But because there's such a fear about paying tax, we go out and we buy equipment we don't need so we can write it off, mm-hmm. or we, we defer a sale, and then we risk the market going down. We incur storage charges. We have storage risk in terms of crop deterioration. And it it just doesn't compute. So farmers, if they're asking, what goal should I set? I think one of the goals we should set is, I want to pay the most tax of any farmer in my area. Ooh, <laughs> you're going against the grain with that statement. Yeah. And I know there's people listening to this that are squirming so bad they can hardly sit still. Yeah. But if you think about it, if you've paid the most tax of anybody in an area, and I'm not saying you you, know, you shouldn't use some some good skilled tax management, but year in and year out, you want to be the person paying the most tax because that means you've had the highest accrual net income. Yeah. I think there's some weird psychology in business owners about the, I'm just going to go out and buy everything I can to avoid paying tax. I'm like, well, that's great. You're just going in the hole if you need it and you had to buy it anyways, different. But sometimes there's some silly psychology in people. Just pay your tax and be grateful. That means you made money, right? No purchase just to avoid tax is makes sense. Yeah. If you need that piece of equipment and it's allows you to increase the utility of your farm and, and you get a, a tax deduction as a byproduct, that's, that's one thing. But going out and just making a capital purchase for the sake of having a lower tax bill is just sheer nonsense. Yeah. No, no tactful way to, to say it any other way. But I don't understand. It's such a common mind frame among business owners. Why? 
I just don't get it. Normally, there there should be some grain of sense there. But you hear many business owners, oh, I'm going out to buy this and this and this. It's like, whoa, wait a minute. Why don't we make some money? And sure, you got to pay the government a little bit, but I don't. Well, a lot of those purchases, I think in the back of their minds, will have a utility somewhere. But just to make a purchase for the sake of a tax deduction where it does not have significant value to your business, it's not needed. It, it makes no financial sense. Okay. Okay. Love it. Thank you. The next category is cash flow budgeting and pro forma income projections. And that's a mouthful. I think everybody has dealt with some form of budgeting if you've run any kind of a business in your life. But rarely do I see really quality proactive budgeting systems. And by that, I mean a, a budgeting system that can project your, your income and ex <clears throat> expense for the coming year on an accrual basis. It can, it can take your cash flow budget and convert cash data and then inventory changes and other adjustments actually project at the end of the year what your pro forma income will look like. And you can't do that with strictly the cash flow budget cash data. You have to use the same accrual processes going forward that you do looking backwards to look at how did I do last year on an accrual basis versus cash. Hmm. And there are just not a lot of people that are using very sophisticated cash flow budgeting tools. Can I share what I'm doing? And you can make fun of me if you want to, but I like to put things, <laughs> go ahead. I can take it. I have big shoulders. Um, I like to just make things a little bit more tangible too. So one of the things I do now, tell me where I am doing it right or going wrong here. So I get my financials on a monthly basis for my business and it's month by month. So I get it in Excel and I actually take it, cut it and paste it. At the end of the year, I go back to create next year. I go back and I take last year's January and put it in and last year's February. And then that's how I build my budget out, but also my cash flow. And I go, okay, well, I know this year and probably 2021, there's going to be no travel. So I adjust that and I go through. So I call that my cash flow. I mean, there's the budget and then I'm actually doing my cash flow spreadsheet there. So where do I need to go from there? Well, you're, those are all valid steps. The, okay. The challenge is cash flow only records what you actually converted to income in the current year. Okay. And if you're in a service business or a consulting business, that's pretty accurate. But if you're in the commodity production business, you might, you might have only sold two thirds of what you grew that year. So the cash flow is only going to show you what you converted to cash. It's only going to show those bills that you actually paid for in cash. Mm -hmm. So unless you have a system to account for the unpaid bills, the unsold inventories and so forth, so that not only looking back 12 months, but looking forward 12 months. <clears throat> I'm going to project next year's income and expense. You have to look at all the cash that you'll create in addition to those assets that won't be liquidated that are production assets. Those bills that you'll create that are not going to be paid. So for example, almost everybody has accrued interest at the end of the year. Well, if you're looking at a good year, a lot of times we tend to pay it all up the last day of the year. But the next year, you might not have such a good year, and you may decide, I'm just going to let that interest go into next year. It's not going to show up on your cash flow, but it has to be accounted for if you're going to look at a pro forma net income. Okay. Because it's something that was an expense that was created, it's owed, whether or not it was paid. Okay. So I kind of, I do my Tracy accounting system a little bit and throw some stuff in that wasn't actually paid for. <laughs> do you like my made up accounting system? <laughs> I, I think you're actually doing a lot of things right. Oh, Probably okay. More right than a lot of your peers, but there's, 
there's doing it okay and then there's doing it well or doing it with somewhat perfection. And that's where we struggle is we, we really find it hard to find a system where we can do a good job of projecting pro forma net in for the coming year. And the other dimension there is there's a lot of emphasis on saying, well, how am I doing according to my budget? What did I actually spend versus my budget? And I don't get too hung up on that. What I want to do is do a budget for the next 12 months. And then every month, I'm going to take that same budget tool. And as each month is, is actually behind me, I'm going to replace those estimated budget numbers with actual. And I'm continually focusing on what's my new year end number now look like. That's so what I do. Yay. <laughs> by nine months, I have nine months of real data and only three months of estimated data but it's still focusing me towards that year end pro forma net income. And how has the events to date um, changed my projected income to the good or, or worse? And I, I think putting a lot of emphasis on, well, this is my budget versus actual looking backwards, but not looking at how that affects your year end net income is we, we fall down on that. That is actually what I do. I go in and at the end of every month when I get my new financials, I go and update it. So my goal is by the end of the year, that's real financials. But I will admit to you, Dick, that I have not done a proper cash flow for our farm because it is tricky. It's very easy for a business with income in and out. Very straightforward. I'm like, we know our cash flow and we manage it well. But I have, I've made a few attempts and I get so darn frustrated because I go, well, wait a minute, the top line is a little weird because the income's over there. <laughs> it's, a, it's a little trickier. Yeah. Anyway. Well, I think you have the gist of it. <clears throat> so if, any more questions on cash flows? No. I think that was great. Thank you. So the next topic is trend analysis, the use of key ratios, and are you building a professional annual report for your shareholders? Oh. Um, most farms that I know are business people, and a lot of them have some investments off the farm. They put money into retirement plans and, and stocks, and, and they would never dream of putting money into a stock where you couldn't get a nice annual report that said, this is our company, this is our strategic plan, this is our five-year trend sheet, and, and look how good we are. But how many farmers think about that for their own business? How, how good a job are we at looking at not only this year's financial position and, and performance, but how's it compared to last year and five years ago? And what are our trends in working capital and debt asset ratio and and profitability. Um, hmm. Depending on which, which set of standards you want to look at, there's 15 to 20 key ratios in agriculture that are critical financial ratios. Okay. I don't get hung up on all 20 of those. I think it's important for farm producers to settle on half a dozen or, or so of those really critical bottom line indicators. And every year, update your farm financial trend sheet. Put the, do the racial calculations so that you can see how's my liquidity changed from year to year? How's my debt to asset ratio? Is it getting better or worse? What's my target? And, and have it not just be, well, it will be what it is. Have it be more of a goal-directed approach. What's my operating profit margin? What's turnover doing? And how are those impacting return on assets and return on equity? Uh, these are common language um, key indicators outside agriculture that every business pays close attention to. And we in agriculture should be looking at those as well. I One think sometimes they're a bit critical. intimidating, right? What's that? Sorry, Dick, I interrupted you there. I just said sometimes, and even myself, I'm fairly comfortable and interested in financials and I love it because I know it's so important, but sometimes those ratios, they just sound a little bit intimidating, right? They do, and I think part of that challenge is it's not our comfort zone. Yeah. But if we recognize that as a big business, somebody in our operation needs to be proficient in the finances, if we don't want to do that in-source, <clears throat> we should be willing <clears throat> to pay some, 
some money out to our professionals. Most farms have a relationship with a tax accountant and a financial advisor where this is not rocket science. It's not hard to do. But think of the value, the PR value of, of a farmer sitting down with his or her spouse and partners and being able to share this annually so that people can feel good about the business they're in, feel good that there's good returns, that they're liquid, they're solvent, they're profitable, and that the trends are solid or positive. And if they're not, if they're negative, you go into that with least the knowledge that we've got some things to fix and you have a foundation for strategic thinking where you can fix things that need to be fixed. In the absence of this, you're just flying blind. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I always liken it to today's farmers have so much technology. They would never dream of getting in a drill and not being able to look at a computer that monitors seating rate and speed and all the engine performance indicators fuel consumption, they would not even move if they couldn't track that. Uh Yet, we're driving multi-million dollar businesses where we're not looking at the gauges and knowing whether or not we're in the green, the yellow, or the red. And whether your seating rate is 10 or 15% low or high, if it's bad, it's not going to put you out of business near as fast as if you're not paying attention to working capital or profitability or or some of these key financial indicators. And if they go into the red for a long period of time, you're out of business. So I think it's critical to to get comfortable with what are the key indicators? How do we calculate them annually? How do we put that into a trend sheet where we look at about at least a five year look and, and engage the shareholders in a really good interpretation of that if farmers can't do it, invite your banker to your annual meeting and have them explain your financial performance. A lot of bankers would jump at this for free as a PR thing. And that way you don't have to admit your ignorance on your financials as well. That was a little zinger. I have a question for you. So we have accountants that prepare our taxes. Everybody has that. So let's say... I mean, just, you got to have the will to want to do it, right? Just dive in and take your financials, read them, learn, take Excel, line it up, enter it in, whatever way you want to do it. I'm sure there's more sophisticated ways, but who is that person or how does a farmer even go about to start learning financial ratios? Who do you ask? Well, it's, it's in the financial services in, industry. <clears throat> you know, your large, yeah, all of your large um, MNP, BDO, all those large um, accounting and financial analysis firms have people and processes. They do this every day. Okay. I, I know a lot of Canadian farmers who they very much value that service out of their providers. Part of the challenge is it's not free. And so if you don't see value to it, you're not willing to spend the money with a consulting professional to do this analytical work. It isn't rocket science. The biggest thing is getting a system set up where you can do it right. And once you have a system set up, updating this annually is not hard at all. I agree. It's just pretty much cut and paste. And a lot of things, I have our farm financials and I take them every year, same thing, line them up. And it's pretty easy. I love numbers. I said it in a previous episode, people are so intimidated by numbers, but out of everything we deal with as business owners, numbers are probably the easiest thing. They don't give you grief. They don't talk back. They don't not show up to work. They're black and white. Looking at your numbers and getting comfortable is so much easier than managing people and I mean, all the stuff that farmers do to learn about different varieties and all of the production aspects, the financials are the easiest part. Go in, line them up, and then there's trends. They don't vary much every year unless they do, and then you adjust, right? Yeah. And it doesn't mean that we just look at the numbers. I, I like to encourage people, when they, if they have a really good five-year trend sheet, for every year, they have a 
You know, Excel is great. You can create little sub tabs for each year and you can actually create two tabs for each year. One should be your financial data and the second tab should be a narration of what made that year what it was. Mm. So if you're looking at your working capital and debt asset ratio, debt asset ratio and you go, wow, it's way better or way worse um, right now than it was three years ago. Well, maybe you bought some land and put a lot of debt on to do it. There's, there's a reason why some of these ratios change. And if that reason is, is a good reason, you don't become alarmed. But what if, what if you look at your operating profit margin and you're going along kind of milk toast and then it took a big jump this last two years ago. Somebody said, well, what caused that? Well, we had a huge opportunity to grow the farm and increase our efficiency. We didn't have to buy more combines. We had a lot of unused management capacity. But that efficiency gain jumps right out at you, both in profit margin and turnover ratio. And it's like there's a reason why that number changed. And once you get lay people like farmers who love to drive tractors and chase animals to ask intelligent questions about those numbers, you've really arrived in terms of financial analysis. And it, it drives home another point that I think oftentimes we just get hung up on we work here, but we forget that we're investors. Mm, that's to be cool. a successful investor, you have a responsibility to educate yourself on how to interpret financials. I absolutely hate it when somebody said, well, just let somebody else deal with the finances. I've got money, I got my money invested here and I'll just work hard and farm and but I'm not gonna worry about interpreting it because I don't understand it. I would never have a partner that takes that attitude because they're an investor and I want a responsible investor that takes their job seriously of evaluating financials and understanding performance. Sorry, I get in my soapbox there a little bit. Well, it's funny you say that. I the reason I learned financials was I guess two parts, and I'm not sure chicken or egg, which one would have come first, but I had people I was accountable to, to report the progress of a business. And I, we had books, we had financials, and I had to be savvy or else I would have lost that job. So it, in farming, now I'll flip to the farm side. It's okay. It's okay to not have that because it's just our money and we don't necessarily need it, right? You could build this case up as I'm sure many do. We're busy. We don't have time. We don't have the knowledge. We don't want to learn. Whatever it is, you can get away with it on the farm because it's your business. But in the business that I'm referring to, if I didn't learn financials and how to report and how to read it and be able to report that to the shareholders, I would have lost my job and been replaced very quickly by somebody that knew what they were doing and could confidently communicate that, right? And I think that is more common outside of agriculture. Again, yep. Agriculture, we, we didn't farming because we want to grow stuff. Yeah. And we, we don't go into it because we enjoy reviewing financials and, and having board meetings and looking at this stuff. But if we're going to get serious, when you think about it, most farms have their entire net worth invested in their farm. Wouldn't you want to know how it's performing and if it's a good investment? Uh, that, that to me is just minimum responsibility of being an investor. I love it. And that's a neat mind frame switch for the agricultural world, right? This is, we're, we're investors in this operation. The second a farmer would look out to a different investment, they would want to know, right? If they were putting money into somebody else's business, guaranteed, they would be asking in a quick hurry, wait a minute, can we see some financials or can you report to me how this is doing? I just put money in with you, right? But then we come home and we might be okay with not having our own data. I could see that happening. I could probably even do it. There's me on my soapbox. <laughs> right. Well, we just have two more topics if we have time here. And I'm going to just go through them rather briefly. Um, yes, one is how, how do we use models to optimize capital asset purchases? And the second one is how do we analyze our capital debt repayment capacity. 
And maybe I'll take this last one first because it won't take long. Farmers are good at looking at working capital and debt asset ratio and basic profitability. But probably one of the most important metrics that the lenders look at is what is your debt service capacity? And that calculation gets a little more complicated, but it takes a look at not only what income and cash you're creating from operations, um, what outside income do you have to add to that? And then that's your capacity. Then it measures what your commitments are. All your principal payments on term debt, um, capital debt interest, um, unfunded equipment replacement. Let's say that every year you try to buy a quarter of a million dollars worth of new equipment out of cash. And you, you buy a quarter of a million dollars that you fund with debt. Well, if, you, if you're planning every year to be able to fund from operations a quarter million dollars in debt, then that's part of your annual commitments. It goes into calculating your capital debt repayment capacity. When, when you get in good times, that number goes above one to one substantially. When we get in tight periods of time where farmers are they're losing money, we, you can be profitable but not be able to pay your debt payments. Mm. And that's a, that's a fallacy. People think, well, as long as I'm profitable, I'll be all right. But they might have bought a combine or large tractor that has payments over a five or seven year period where there's a not enough cash flow to fund those payments within the time frame that they've created. Mm. So if they're still profitable, it may mean scheduling is now for longer term, terms. But if they're not profitable, then we have a, other, a different challenge to deal with. So... This is another metric that if you are not comfortable calculating it, make sure that your financial advisors are helping you to prepare this annually. Pay attention to that ratio. Make sure it's up there in the 1.2 to 1.5 to 1 category. Um, and the other thing to be careful here is, I don't look at this as a number that should be a steady, steady year to year. We might go we might have a really high number for three years, and then we, we do a giant purchase in a given year where that number is negative. But on average, we're fine. So capital debt repayment capacity is more of a longer term metric where we need to look at what is the trend. And we might have some lows and highs because in a given year, we may not buy any equipment. Another year, we may take on a debt and may pay a whole bunch off. But it's over time, on average, what is that number looking like? Okay. So the last one is, this can get quite complicated, but I'll just try to get the, the high cliff notes. Do we have an analytical process on major purchase items like combines, sprayers, big baiters, where we're saying, I've analyzed this and I'm making the optimal decision? Mm. What do you mean by optimal? Unfortunately, a lot of those decisions are based, based on the fact that I can afford it, the banker will finance it, and I can make the payments. But that may not be the optimal decision. Based on your hours of use or acres that you put on annually, we have four different options on capital equipment. We can buy, we can lease, we can custom hire, or we can joint venture with somebody else where we can have shared ownership. Okay. Every major large equipment item that we look at, we look at all four of those options. And <clears throat> there are some really good analytical models. Alberta had a tool called Rope in the Web that could look at cost per hour and cost per acre for various kinds of equipment. Oh. They pulled that from the website. Um, unfortunately, it was one of the best analytical tools I've ever used. Uh, Kansas State University in, in the U.S. has a <clears throat> very sophisticated model that you can put in your data and you can see what it costs to lease, what it costs to own. <coughs> Excuse me. But I would never want to make a large capital investment without doing that analysis. <coughs> We're running sprayer over maybe twenty to 30,000 acres a year. And our cost per acre to run that sprayer are under $5. But if we only had a 1,000-acre farm, 
there's no way we could have justify a half million dollar sprayer. That is what I wonder. You look at you some people's operations. Oh, sorry. Interest and depreciation and the fixed costs that go into that. You're probably more cost effective to have it custom hired or to rent a piece of equipment if you can access it. Okay. So sometimes okay. that's that is not an option and you, you don't you can't make the optimal decision because there's not availability of custom hire and there's not availability of rentals. But at least you should do the analysis and know what's it cost me per acre or per hour to do it this way versus that. Okay. For years, I did analytical uh, work for farmers looking at buying combines. And that was back when the interest rates were much higher. We didn't have a lot of these <clears throat> roll programs where they were rolling without any kind of payments or whatever. But it was pretty common to see that if you didn't run a combine at least 300 hours a year, you couldn't justify owning it. Okay. There were people out there that were putting... 100 to 150 separator hours on a combine annually and buying a combine. And they were wasting thirty to $40,000 a year in cost by owning that machine as opposed to renting it or leasing it or custom hiring. Hmm. Well, that's real money. That's so when you, when you think about... If I just made two bad decisions on a farm with some of today's equipment out there, I might be wasting sixty to a hundred thousand dollars in equipment expense. That pays for a pretty darn competent uh, chief financial officer to help analyze these things. Amen. And I, you say, well, I can't afford that high-level financial analyst on my farm, or I can't afford to go pay those guys at the accounting firm and financial management firm those big dollars, but they can afford to waste $30,000 on one transaction. I had a client who was a very large, um, they put up custom alfalfa and they were selling around 10,000 ton a year, huge operation. And they were custom hiring all their bailing. And so we did an analysis and said, it's costing you $20 a ton more, excuse me, ten dollars a ton more to outsource this than if you bought your own baler and tractors. Hmm. Once they ran the numbers, they went, "Well, that's a no-brainer." They end up buying two tractors and two balers, okay. and so they're they're saving for each one of those units twenty-five to thirty thousand dollars a year in cost because their their level of throughput is such that they should be owning, not renting or, or custom hiring. So this is a, a financial science that has been proven. It's it's not rocket science. And if we were not tapping that kind of information, we're probably leaving money on the table in terms of optimizing decisions. I agree. We've done similar types of calculations. And you know what? It's frustrating and annoying and you want to avoid it. I'll be honest, Dick, and I like numbers and I, re I appreciate how important they are. But when we were looking at whether it makes sense to own all the equipment to make our hay or hire it out or just turn our fields into pastures so we can have that many more units, that much more revenue and buy all our hay in. Oh my goodness. You got to have some commitment. It's simple, but you got to have some commitment. And once you work through those numbers, wow, you can realize that, hmm, we've been making some silly decisions for quite some time. Exactly. Well, I don't know if I would call them silly. Ignorance is bliss. If you don't know that you haven't made the optimal decision, you've got the net worth, you've got the working capital, you've got ample cash to make the payments, you go, why would I not proceed? But it's it's the difference between saying I'm making the decision because I can afford it versus I'm making this decision because it's the optimal decision. And the difference between I can afford it and optimization oftentimes is a very big number. Hmm. 
Nice. That was great stuff. Well, that's an hour's worth of people realizing they have a lot of headaches they need to work on. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody's going to grab <laughs> their cup of coffee yeah. and um, hopefully jump right to the pump on these items. There's some big stuff there, but you know what? Just like anything, it starts with a small step. And myself too, I'm sitting here going, wow, I would love to say I have all these ratios and all of this done, but you know what? I'm pretty darn proud that we have our financials, a budget, a cash flow, and I'm sitting here going, oh my gosh, I have work to do yet. <laughs> and it's a good thing, right? Well, even when you're teaching this, you look at your own stuff and there's always room for improvement. Amen. I love it. And that's my biggest motivator is I figure if I'm, I have to practice what I preach or I'm a hypocrite. And it's, it's been a, a great payoff to our own business by not only having the incentive to do it because it's a good idea, but I want to prove to myself that, yeah, I did this. It had a good consequence. And so I can be with 100% conviction to my audiences that, yes, here's, here's something you should do and here's why you should do it and here's the cost of not doing it. I think that's the thing we overlook oftentimes is the cost of not following best practices is very quantifiable. Mm. whether it's a financial practice, a human resource management practice, or a governance, I can quantify all day long the consequences of not following best practices. Yep, I agree. Okay, good stuff. I know earlier in the beginning of the episode, I mentioned Dick's guidebook that he's creating, and I know you're actually updating that right now, Building Effective more farm management systems. I think I got that right. We did a previous episode. So if you're interested, Dick has created a binder with a lot of really good stuff in there. I won't go into it. You can catch the other episode. Dick, if people want to learn more about you, find out about the guidebook, where can they connect with you and learn more? Well, the best thing is just to go to the website. There's, there's a lot of downloadable free information there are a lot of financial tools um, we're actually doing some overhaul right now so it's it's having some issues but you'll be patient with my web webmaster um, things like the trend sheet that's on there if you would like to download that and experiment with doing a five-year financial trend so i get asked all the time if if i really want to improve my financial literacy where do i start and this is people that are out in business or working they you know they've been through college they've had some formal education but now they want on the job continuing education um, we just don't have good answers for them on where they can find this i teach at the tpat program which is the a executive program and i have a list of about a dozen financial literacy resources that you can tap. Some of them are online. Some of them are workshops you have to attend. So if any of your readers is in that boat and they want to email me, I'd be gladly send them that list. Okay. Excellent. And I know Farm Management Canada has uh, some resources that if you look at their, their financial training resources, I would look there as well. Excellent. Thank you for sharing that. I know you shared a lot of good stuff. And I know you can probably top that. Do you have any parting words, words of wisdom or encouragement for our audience as they are working on finding the gold in their farm business? I think farmers get a lot of satisfaction about producing an excellent crop. Yeah. And we need to reach the point where we get that same kind of satisfaction by creating quality financial records, quality financial analysis that is understood and shared amongst our, our ownership teams. And when you reach a point where that is equally valued with production, um, you've changed your culture to a professionally managed business. Mm -hmm. and I think most farmers would say, I aspire to that, but how do I define how far short I am? 
In many cases, they're good at production, but they fall drastically short in financial management and in human resource type areas in their business. But they're, they're definable areas where we can make continual progress. Uh, it's going to be self-study. It's going to be going to workshops, non-job training. Every chance you get, grab that opportunity. Things like these podcasts that you do are a great resource because farms can sit in their tractors and combines and listen to these things, and they don't have to take any time away from work. Thank you. Especially with all the auto steer out there. They can just put it on autopilot and start taking notes. I love it. Those were good, great, excellent words of wisdom. Thank you, Dick. They know how to find you, and I know you are more than willing to connect with anyone in our audience that has questions. So thank you. Thank you for joining us, Dick. I am always very grateful for the time you spend with us here. So thank you, thank you, thank you. And thank you guys in the audience. If you like this episode as much as I did, like it, share it, and subscribe. Share it out so that other farmers get this great material and the wisdom from guests like Dick. Thank you and see you on the next episode of the Impact Farming Show. Bye, everybody. You've been listening to Impact Farming. For more great episodes and articles designed to help you manage and grow your farming operation, head on over to farmmarketer.com. Don't forget to sign up while you're there. We will see you on the next episode.